I'm Bob Brokaw, and uh, Hans contacted me to do a uh, do a presentation on scroll saws, and I'm thinking again, <laughs> what what haven't I told y'all about it? And then the more I got to thinking about it and asking people questions, I came up with about three hours worth of material. So here we start. <laughs> yeah, one of the uh, one of the people I got a good amount of material from was Steve Good. I called and told him what. Uh, what I was up against here, and did he have anything in particular that uh, he wanted me to cover? And that, conver <laughs> that conversation went on for about two hours. <laughs> okay, um, one of the first things that we haven't covered much about, I always show you a scroll saw that is taken apart. This is something that I regularly do to a scroll saw that I'm servicing in my shop. Um, take the thing apart, put a, uh, put a socket here and a bolt so that you can attach the front half of the machine to the back half. Uh, I also reinsert these two pieces of hardware here to make sure that the foot is still attached. You have to also reattach the, uh, the upper arm, otherwise it'll wind up on the table. And then you also want to attach the, uh, the pivot rod back there so that it uh, behaves itself. And once you do that, you can, you can turn the saw on and run it up to speed. And I frequently do that to find out if, you know, if I've made the noises go away or if anything else seems to be loose, uh, things like that. Okay, in the number of times that I have done that, I've always demonstrated it with the table off without explaining to anybody what's involved in taking the table off. Actually, you're not going to see much happen other than to this wedge in the back here. But when you, let me go ahead and loosen the blade here, it's more dramatic that way. But when you operate the tensioner, what you're doing is you're pulling a wedge that's right there. And pretty much what that, all this tensioner does is it controls the arm height. So it makes the arm go up and down. And Guys like Hans, they, they come to me and they say, is there any way that you could get just that much more height out of the blade so I could cut this, this 3D piece that is uh, two and three quarter inches? <laughs> and so technically, yes, you can by taking, uh, taking the covers off of here, get a hold of the, the other end of this rod that you see poking out back here and get one or two more turns of tension on that thing in order to raise the, uh, raise the arm height. There is a point of no return though when you get the thing jacked up so high that you can't get hold of the end of the blade. And also when you do another Hans trick on there, once you get that kind of blade height, he likes to turn the speed up to about a 10. <laughs> And suddenly things will start colliding together, so got to make other modifications to the saw to get that to work. He only uses a 10 because it's got a 12. Yeah. Hmm? He only uses a 10 because it's not a 12. Right. He, uh, he liked it when some, some defect befell the motor or something like that, and it took off at double speed. Oh, he, he thought that was wonderful. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to show you here is what's involved in taking the the table off and what to do after it's off. First thing is the the knob that holds it to the trunnion or hold, holds the trunnion to the rest of the saw that is. Uh, this is one that I've already 
done a little bit of customization to. This step washer on here normally comes separate. And one of the modifications that I do to a saw is usually take a piece of double stick tape, put that on there, put that washer on there, because there's no logical reason to separate these two parts. And it is a pain in the butt to try to get both of those things back together to get the table on. Okay, what you see me struggling with there is the fact that this or this uh, rubber o-ring that is in here has never been lubricated. That makes it pretty difficult to to get that thing off of there. So did, did a little bit of research on what you're supposed to do with that. I discovered that petroleum lubricants attack uh, rubber like o-rings. So what I found is a uh, plumber's version of a lubricant so it's a uh, synthetic lube that is non-petroleum so I put that on there in order to make that thing slip on and off easier okay another item that Vaseline is petroleum. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the name. <laughs> okay, another thing that people oftentimes lose sight of when they are uh, putting one of these saws together, turn this thing around so Buzz can get a little bit better shot of it. This trunnion that is underneath here, it controls the tilt of the table from side to side. Uh, it also has some amount of movement front to back. As well as if I hold the trunnion still, I can now slide the table side to side. I could get this thing in a configuration that you wouldn't be able to thread a blade. So once you, you know, if you're assembling a saw out of the box, this is one of the parts that you put on. So one of the things that you need to look for, one of the things I see right off here is that somebody used different hardware than what, <laughs> what DeWalt normally supplies. This is normally a uh, socket head metric screw. This is, uh, this is a hex head. Uh, but at any rate, what you need to do is once you get this thing lined up in there, you need to be prepared to uh, center the table side to side so that the blade goes through the center of the hole and let me s get this over here for a moment this is the zero indicator right here that that tells your table or that, that gives you a visual confirmation that the thing is back at zero. But what you need to do is level the table first. So we, all I'm doing is while, while I got it this far apart, I'm pointing it out that uh, this is the part. And that what you do is you loosen this screw up. Then once you get your table centered exactly where you want it, this indicator should now point at zero. So now you can tighten this back down. Now, by the, uh, by the School of Hard Knocks, I will tell you that this, this spring plunger that's right here, the spring plunger that's right here, when you take a look at the DeWalt parts manual, uh, they have a single number for this whole assembly right here. When you order that assembly, it comes without that plunger. DeWalt has no answer for that. So uh, when I had several of these things in that condition, because uh, people that brought me saws, you know, this part was missing. Uh, lo and behold, I discovered that there is a website out there called springplungers.com. 
there's a website for everything. <laughs> Just like on smartphones, you know, app for everything. And lo and behold, they had one that worked, so I ordered a few and haven't found one missing since. But at any rate, what that detent does is as you, as you rotate the table, once you've got this thing set to zero, as, as you rotate the table, that spring plunger will dive into that slot right there, and, and you can feel that thing when it hits there, and that'll, that'll tell you you're at zero. Most scrollers that I know of, they, you know, they don't put any kind of angle on, on their cuttings. One other thing that I have frequently run into, you'll notice here that when I go to push on this thing, that bolt dives in the hole. When you go to put the trunnion on, the trunnion runs into that thing and pushes the bolt down in the center. And you go to reach it around in there, and suddenly you make the air turn blue. <laughs> okay, what I've done to uh, hit that off, if Buzz and or Dan can get over here and get a shot of this, technique that I have come up with for correcting that condition is there's a, they're casting wings down here on either side of that bolt. All I have to do is take a punch like this and give that thing one smack with a hammer to bend it just slightly, go over there and grab a hold of the ears of that, that bolt. So usually whenever I get a, get a machine in the shop, this is part of my normal um, service charge, is I, I go ahead and peen that thing over so that that bolt will stay put. So when you go to put the table back on, you don't, don't fight with it so much. Any questions on that? Been talking all this time and nobody's got any questions. Say again? Um, waterproof grease is what it's typically referred to as. This is Ace. I got it at Ace Hardware. Yeah. Uh, no, there's no silicone in it. It's it's a purely water-based. I tried to get it as uh, you know as environmentally friendly as possible to make sure that there was no uh, petroleum lubricant in it. I try to avoid using any. Uh, silicon-based products in my shop because of the tendency that that stuff has to uh, mess with your finish. Because uh, most finishes that I know I don't want to adhere to silicone. Have you used any lithium-based? I'm aware of it, but uh, I haven't tried it. Steve brought up the fact that uh, he said you would be amazed at how many people have come up with creative ways to try to change a fuse. Yes, sir. Would it not be a good idea to unplug it before you start messing with it? It is. It is. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, some yep. people don't know that you can blow up your whole motor. Yep. That's what they did with mine in here. They ruined your whole motor. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, since uh, Hans says that, he he reminded me one time he got a hold of one of these fuse things and he had he had the fuse holder out right here and he's still dragging wire. <laughs> Buzz, I don't know if you can get a shot on top of this. Yeah, that's pretty good. There's a narrow slot in there that is uh, usually big for anything, anything except like a jeweler screwdriver or some sort of a very small cabinet screwdriver. And all you need to do to get that, get that thing loose, I have rested this jeweler screwdriver in there, and when you press down, Okay, test it, there we go. When you press down, that fuse holder pops open. And you drag this assembly out. It's a fairly, fairly common fuse. Use a, just a regular ohmmeter or light or some sort of indicator light to test it. 
then once you get the same fuse ready to reinstall, what you do is just push it in. It's spring loaded. Where You'll did you get that fuse? Ace Hardware. Yeah. Uh, Ace Hardware would probably be a better choice than automotive because automotive has gone to. Are you, you know. saying it's a standard fuse, but it's not a standard fuse holder? Yes. That would be a good description of it. Yep. Until. Yep. That's about as common as you get, AGC3. Okay, so that, uh, I've only seen, um, I think it's three blown fuses in all the scroll saws that I've worked on. Uh, one of which I, I witnessed the fuse blow was when <laughs> Rob and, and Hans were busy cutting books, but they had some of these Reader's Digest books that, uh, that they were cutting the thing up into a, a book safe. And I never realized how, how rough paper is on a, on a scroll saw blade, but it, uh, it did a number. They're busy cutting it away, and all of a sudden, everything went dark. <laughs> Bob? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the nature, the, big, the, the most predominant nature of problems you, that you get? Are they uh, mechanical or electronic? Uh, almost always mechanical. These, these switches are not built for, you know, extended duty, you know, many, many, many operations. So that's why I usually recommend to people that they use a, like this saw is equipped with a foot switch. You know, you hit the, hit the saw on and then you use the foot switch after that. That way if the, if the foot switch, you know, goes bad after, you know, 70,000 operations or something like that, you can replace the foot switch for $20 rather than taking the saw apart in order to try to get to this switch. And the hope switch, you don't. Those switches aren't that hard to replace, though, are they? You know, they're not they aren't terribly place. hard, but they're hard oh. to get, hard to get to. Oh. <laughs> air hose came off again. It came off again. My air hose came off again. Is it, it is split? Can I take that piece out and shorten my air hose? Yep, sure can. <coughs> but, uh, spares of those over here. You'll notice a length difference between these two. And the uh, main reason is that, you know, we've, we've uh, shortened this one a few times. I have uh, come up with a number of different ways of attaching these. The most effective way is usually to get some needle nose uh, vice grips, and I get a hold of the second knuckle on here, not the one closest to the one that you're trying to attach to the to the saw, but back one, and then use a torch to apply some heat to this piece, not very much, but just to soften it slightly, and then take that needle nose vice grip up there and just push that thing on. It's usually quite easy and much less likely to, to crack this, this ring here and you wind up pulling that one off and do it again and pull that one off. And that's how it gets to be this long. <laughs> <laughs> that answer your question, George? Or Hans? <coughs> well, a heat gun do it as well or do you need a pull? Yeah, heat gun, heat gun will do it fine. Doesn't take I, I just mentioned uh, uh, torch because I didn't have uh, didn't have a heat gun until just recently when uh, Harbor Freight put them on sale. <laughs> but you don't realize how much you use that until it's not there. Right. It is quite an effective piece. Okay, Hans, you want to give me a hand uh, yes, putting this back on? Finger, but that's okay. 
I was hunting for that blade that was, oh, there it is. Screw this mostly twist. Yes, thank you. You know, what Hines was reinforcing there is why, why I peen over that bolt once I got the saw apart. Okay, while you're down there, you want to thread that blade and I'll get a square. This is not spiral. I used to do that. I used to put epoxy on there. Then I, that I found out it was much faster because after you put epoxy on, you got to let it sit up for a while. And I found out it was a lot faster to just smash, smack that casting, <laughs> and you're ready to go right then. I'm perfect. That's what I was trying to get it to do. Okay. okay. I got a little tiny bit of aggressiveness. No, no, no. Um, you got a little. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then what I'm going to have Buzz do is uh, line this up. Most scrollers uh, think they're done when they get the when they get the blade square side to side. In other words, when they when they set it there and you can't see any light through the blade. Okay, there we go. I got Get it fairly good there. At that point, your your blade, I mean your your table is level side to side, so you gotta you gotta cut a straight up and down uh, path all the way through there. What it doesn't give you an indication of is whether the blade is tilted forward or back. Which, uh, if you're trying to stack cut uh, fretwork like what Walt was trying to do, you will get some less than desirable results. <laughs> yeah, you see the, plate, the blade go uh, forward and backward, but it's the whole assembly at one time rather than the top or the bottom cycling. So the important thing is, is that blade needs to be parallel side to side and front to rear. Now then the whole point of that was that when we, when we measure this one to try to get the, the front to rear, matter of fact I've probably got some better pictures of that on my PowerPoint that I had here. Okay, uh, let's take a minute and I skipped around a little bit. Let's talk about some blade clamps. This is one of the things that we seldom pay much attention to until they don't work. Uh, fair amount of hardware there to hold that thing in place.
But what we're talking about here is a, uh, is a simple casting. It's got a pretty good amount of machining going on to it to cut this slot out here so that it goes on these, uh, these rockers and, and the strut that holds the, uh, holds the other end of the rocker in place. But there are two things that, uh, that go into the front of here. One is a, a set screw that goes on one side on this upper, upper blade clamp. You get a set screw that goes in this side. And then on this side, you've got the, the actual uh, blade clamp that we've got this enhancement knob on there to enable you to get that, get that thing in place. Let me uh, show you one of these that's that I can loosen. You go ahead and take this blade clamp the rest of the way out, and all that's there is a set screw on the other side that's got a, a flat spot on it to uh, back up against the back, back of the blade. One of the things that most people lose sight of is on the end of this uh, blade clamp, there is a loose plunger there that I've just pulled that thing out slightly. And you can see that this thing floats. It goes in and out. It also rotates, or it is supposed to rotate. Very often times, people will forget that that thing is supposed to be lubricated. And this is where I learned about the, uh, the non-petroleum lubricants. If you use a petroleum lubricant on this thing, it's going to eat that O-ring in a very short time. What you need to do is put a little bit of uh, that lubricant that I had, at, uh, this, this stuff here. On that O-ring, and then put it back in here. All right, keep in mind that, that that shaft is supposed to turn. Another thing to pay attention to while we get this thing out is a lot of people will take this thing out and that, that anvil that is there is just as shiny. I mean, it is, it is shiny polished Looks about like Rob's head there with, with, without a ball cap on. <laughs> um, what I recommend you do there is clamp that thing in a vise and just hit that thing a couple of passes with a, with a file. As flat a file as you can find and try to keep it as level as you can just to rough it up. So that when you get this thing back in here and you go to mount, mount a blade in there, that it'll, it'll grab a hold of that blade and hold it. The whole reason for that anvil there is as the blade, as this uh, mechanism goes, goes up and down, that blade needs to rotate. And it rotates on this anvil. It rotates against this face of this set screw that's on the other side. Um, if, that if that doesn't work, then you're going to start bending blades and breaking them right at the top. How often do you have to lubricate those? About once a year, maybe. Yes? So, um, how often do you recommend, like, tuning up, checking that stuff when it makes a noise, or do you say, mm -hmm. or bring it to you once a year? <laughs> if it I was making money. Well, every three months, you ought to bring it in there. <laughs> Probably the best bet is when, when you start having difficulty, like you're, you're muttering under your breath about why can't I get this cut to work right, it's, it's time to just, you know, push back a little bit and start, start looking through some of these things to try to figure out, you know, what's causing this. Smoke's also bad. Case, case in point is when, you know, <laughs> the, the part that I just went through there where you're tightening this uh, blade clamp down, if you pull the blade out and the thing's bent, 
then it's time to start figuring out why. <laughs> Which direction is it bent? If it's side to side, it could be the set screw is uh, either through too far or not far enough. Uh, if it's bent front to rear, chances are it's because that, that anvil that goes through that blade clamp is, uh, is frozen. So it's a it's a fairly easy thing to do to. When it's what? When it's making the bearing sound, because I've never heard it make a bearing sound. You'll know. You'll know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You'll, You'll know. sound completely different. Okay. When you uh, when you take this blade clamp out and you grab a hold of this thing and you and you can't turn it, that's not good. <laughs> But it's time to lubricate it, definitely. Okay, let's dive back into here for a minute. I talked about the O-ring lubrication. The fact that I recommend using uh, a non-petroleum grease. And I'll show you another place where you need that in a little bit. Uh, you also want to secure that trunnion screw so that you don't have a three-person operation here to go put the table back on when you're done. For centering the table, once you've got uh, the table back on there, looks like this one was properly done in that the blade is almost in the center of the hole. If it's not, you loosen those two screws underneath, slide it side to side slightly, tighten them back <coughs> up again. Okay, now then for zeroing the table, we talked briefly about the, that indicator, that number 76 part that's on there. You, uh, you loosen that set screw, go ahead and center your table so that it's exactly square. And the, the, way, you, the way you do that is go ahead and stick that, stick that detent in there so that it's gonna be locked in, then you loosen the screw for the indicator so that when you rotate the table, you're moving the, the detent and all and the indicator so that you wind up with a square condition between the blade and the tabletop. Then you tighten that, that uh, set screw back down again and you should be good to go. If you ever have to tilt your table, it's easy to rotate it and you can feel that detent lock into place then. And I've got the admonition on here to uh, guard that spring plunger. Put that dude in with probably some epoxy. That would be a good, good use of epoxy to hold that thing in place. It's easy enough to break loose if you, if you have to get it loose for whatever reason. I have a question. It might not pertain to this. Do you work on any other saws besides the wall? I try to avoid it. Okay. Just ask you. <laughs> Not do jets at all. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I get into a jet one time just to find out what what the thing was about. And you found out. And uh, after I tried to get the circuit board out of the thing, so you have, you got to take the circuit board out in order to get the rest of the parts to clear out of the back of the saw. And when I saw that they didn't use any kind of quick disconnects, they use wire nuts to hold everything together and they use all the same color wires with no labels. I decided that the uh, service charge on a, on a jet saw was gonna be about $850. <laughs> so that, that seemed to discourage anybody from bringing me a jet. Also, when you go to put this set screw into the clamp, you want that set screw protruding into the opening about a 32nd of an inch. Some people will try to center it. With it centered in there, you're trying to put a, a flat blade into there. You're usually running into the side of the set screw. So you're hunting, trying to find out where the gap is in there. So you're trying to back out the, the, uh, uh, the tightening screw 
or the, the actual blade clamp itself. So you need to be able to create enough of a hole in the center so that you can easily get your blade in there. Be, be amazed how many people will, you know, they'll fight with this for several seconds before they realize that, oops, wait a minute, I, got <laughs> I don't have enough room to get a blade through, through that gap. Um, the other thing is, before you declare that this uh, set screw is where it ought to be, then what you probably ought to do is put some uh, Loctite or a generic product like that, but particularly use the blue, because that's a mechanical bind. You can break that loose with hand tools. If you accidentally put the red on there, it's going to require some heat to get that thing loose. And you probably won't do that more than about once. What I was leading up to with all that dialogue was headed toward how you uh, how you deal with the with the front to back skew on the blade. If this thing is pitched way forward, if you all take a look at that picture up there, you'll notice that there's uh, an awful lot of light in between the blade and the square. That is with the square touching the top of the blade. The picture doesn't show it because I had this, you know, this big knob in the way. But what that, uh, what that is is a large caster. When you're trying to cut a, uh, you know, very delicate piece of fretwork with that, the uh, all bets are off on what's going to be go going on on the bottom of that that six piece uh, or six deep piece of fretwork when you go to try to cut that thing out. So I started trying to figure out what to do to, uh, to help that thing to improve that gap that was on there. And what I came up with was that slot that's on the top. If you've got the blade uh, pitch too far forward such that it is, it's, it's exposing a big bit of light in front of the blade at the bottom, uh, what I found is that if you go into that blade chuck, take the set screw out, back it out, take the, uh, the tensioner out so that you've got a clear wide open slot in there. So that when you've got a clear wide open slot on there, I found this really high tech solution for enlarging that slot in there. A hacksaw. And just by hand, now bear in mind I've got some, I've got those set screws and stuff like that in the way, so I'm not going to go through with this, but all you have to do is take about three or four strokes this way, just enough that you see some filings down at the bottom, aluminum filings. Then you take that out, you, you set your blade again. You check the, check the squareness, and hopefully you should see some improvement. If not, then do it again another three or four strokes, and uh, just keep doing that until you, until you've got that caster where you like it. Yes, sir. What I just described it is where it is forward leaning. Yeah, the top of it is too far forward. So you're, what you're basically doing is increasing that space in there. Yep, increasing the depth of the back of the the blade chuck. When you, when you put your blade, blade to the back, it, it's truly at the back. Yes. But wouldn't it get to a point that it would be off the set screw? Nope. You're, you're well, you aren't moving it that far. Hard. When you take a look at the normal arrangement on there, I can't draw on the board. I wouldn't dare because we'll get the curtain down. <laughs> but a, uh, uh, let me see here. A large version of what you're looking at there is the set screw is about this face here. Your blade is actually sitting 
kind of like that. Oh, so it's sitting on the front half. It's sitting on the front part, yeah. And what you wind up doing is by cutting that slot a little bit deeper, you're moving that blade back about that far. You're still on the front face of that set screw. The uh, alternative that I've seen people do to correct that condition, they will take the side cover of the saw and they will slot these holes here, which will then allow the assembly that's going into there. Normally what would happen is the screws go, go in and make purchase there at those four points. So you're, you're sliding that screw so that you, you can then adjust it backward and forward and tighten it up. Yeah, yeah. I was aware that Walt had done it with his. I'm not sure how many others had done it, but you you run the risk if you're not as uh, mechanically inclined as Walt is. You could wind up buying a new side cover. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't do it with a warranty. Any yeah. Either. Uh, I took a look at the situation and decided that. Uh, if I had a whoops, I'd just soon have a whoops with a $14 part than it would be for something that's about a $35 part. <laughs> Which two holes again? Hmm? Point them out, the two holes that you're oh. sliding. Yeah, on the bottom cover, it would, be, it would be these two holes here. Uh, a lot of people I've seen will slot them, which requires some finesse. You know, maybe a rat tail file or Dremel tool or something like that. But you've got to have a pretty steady hand to do that and not, not ruin the part. The same two holes on the, on the other side down low. The two holes yeah. that are holding that arm yeah. mechanism facing There was that hole there and this one up here. So those would be the two on the bottom. And I might as well go ahead and, okay, Buzz can probably get uh, these two screws here. These are the holes that you would slot in order to be able to get freedom of movement this direction, front to rear. Joy had asked a question about an issue she had with the tensioner. This is, this is the one for the pivot for the tensioner. Okay, one thing to note here is there is supposed to be a wavy washer underneath the head of this bolt here. If it's missing, it will cause you to have adjustment issues. Okay, there's a roller in here that goes up inside this, this cam mechanism that causes your, your tensioner rod to go in and out. When you rotate your tensioner knob, what you're doing is you're you're moving this shaft in and out, moving this draw rod in and out. And Joy, what I was explaining to you before is this tensioner plate here. This covers your your uh, upper rocker arm assembly. And if Buzz can get a good shot of that, you'll notice there's some material cut away there. I've had a, uh, I've had a hand in doing that. You'll notice when this part operates, this arm moves up and down. with this plate on top, you'll notice what happens there when that, when that counterweight comes up to the bottom of that tensioner plate. If you've got uh, things adjusted in, in your saw to just the right condition where you've got this uh, tensioner rod turned in maybe two or three extra turns, and you crank the speed way up, what you get is you get some overthrow on this counterweight 
and this counterweight will go up there and smack that plate. And when you get a knock like that in one of these saws, it is maddening trying to figure out where it's coming from. Because this whole thing, once it's all together and bolted, covers on it, everything, it sounds like the noise is coming from every part of the saw. You know, when Hans, uh, when Hans takes his speed control and uh, jacks the thing up to, it's got a range of zero to 10, when he gets it up to around 14, it, uh, it starts tending to throw that thing further and smack the bottom of this rod. So it, in addition to making that noise that I showed you with the uh, that counterweight hitting the bottom of the plate, it'll also slap this rod and that causes it to run the length of the machine and just further exacerbates your, your problem determination trying to figure out where the noise is coming from. Yeah, if you're looking for some more uh, some more range on your on your blade tension, what you would do is while you got this thing off, grab it, grab it, the end of this thing with a pair of needle nose, and just give it a twist. No more than about two. You you're twisting your, uh, your your tensioning shaft, your draw rod that goes back to that wedge in the rear. Yeah, what Hans was referring to there is once you're, once you're ready to put this, this part on, you get the hole lined up, and before you set this screw in place, you want to put some of that Loctite on these threads. Okay, now then a lot of people will think uh, you put that thing on there and you, you put a whole lot of tension on it. If you put a whole lot of tension on it, you aren't going to be able to move this thing. So last thing you want to do before you decide enough is enough is make sure that you can still move it and not have the, the uh, screw back out. That way it'll keep tension when you when you put tension on it, it'll stay. And the best bet is to let that sit overnight. Because the stuff does not dry instantaneously. What I'm talking about is these. Oh, okay. The upper and the lower. Um, they can be quite snug. Since you bring up that point there, let's go back to this blade chuck here that's loose. Yeah. Almost every one of the sleeves that is inside there, because what goes, what goes in the middle here in between is a sleeve, and there's a bearing that rides on top of that sleeve. Uh, the general idea behind this is that you tension this, you tighten up the hardware on this, such that you're, you're bending this blade chuck just slightly, just enough to be able to capture that hardened sleeve on each side so that it doesn't move. Okay, so what winds up happening is when you when you put a bolt through there and a nut on the other side, you start tightening that mechanism up. Uh, what you're doing is you're compressing the sides of this casting to make firm contact with that sleeve. So that the sleeve doesn't go side to side. More importantly, it doesn't go front to rear. You're actually pressing this softer casting and embedding that sleeve into the casting. So you put a pretty good amount of tension on it. Just don't get terribly carried away, I, which I know you're capable of doing. <laughs> <laughs> These are push-on connectors in here. I have had them come loose. 
when you're when you're working with the saw, you manipulate this part around, and one of them will fall off. Um, you can get a little bit more of a crimp on it if if you determine that it is really loose. Then the last step is to put that cover on. Okay, I would advise you be a little bit careful on putting these screws back in because it is amazingly easy to cross thread these. I've received a lot of saws that have had some some threads crossed in there or they use too much tension on it. So while I do the last bit of this, anybody got any questions? You guys have been too easy on me today. So if you use a saw a lot, if you use a saw a lot, probably once a year, once eight, every 18 months or so for most people, you, six, you know, 15 months, you need to take it apart and need to keep everything inside, right? Yeah, I will, I will take them apart and if I know what kind of lubricant is there to begin with, if it's uh, the lubricant that I usually like to use, which is this uh, <coughs> Valvoline Synthetic, um, all you need to do is add to it. In other words, expose each one of the needle bearings. Uh, inspect the sleeves, because the sleeves will tell you uh, what the wear pattern is. If you go clean all the grease off of the the sleeve and examine it carefully. If all there is is just a little bit of shine to it and there's no uh, imprinting or denting, that's the thing to look for in those. <coughs> then all you need to do is refresh the lubricant a little bit, put it back together. You know, Bob, if I got a brand new saw, I don't need to, I don't need to do anything with that lubricants for at least 12 months, right? No. On a, uh, on a brand new saw, what you're dealing with there is there's a company called INA that supplies the bearings to DeWalt. They press them into the, the casting. INA has put just enough oil in those uh, needles on the needle bearings to keep the needles from falling out. DeWalt picks it up, looks at it, looks good to me. You know, we're, not, we're in the business of selling saws, we're not in the business of selling lubricant. So they go ahead and put it together. And they estimated that, well, this thing under normal use, it'll last 13 months. Warranty's 12, so we're good. That's why I've convinced a lot of people that have sat in this classroom, if they go get a new saw, or hear of anybody buying a new saw, <coughs> first thing they do is they pick the thing up and bring it to me. I just take it apart and lubricate it, knowing full well that there's virtually no lubricant inside there. So I've probably gone through 10 different saws that have come into my shop where I've actually opened the box <laughs> and voided the warranty by taking it, taking it apart and lubing it. But then again, the, the user walks away with that saw and one of them is still using the thing five years later. It's not making any noise. And he uses the thing as bad as what, what George and Hans do, you know, five to seven days a week, 10 hours a day. Any questions? Well, I, I had it this far apart when I brought it in. <laughs> so I'm just going to carry this one back to my, back to my shop. I've got to get all my tools back together because I've got another, uh, another saw customer coming at 10 o'clock tomorrow. You fix saws, so what's, what's my cost to fix in a saw? Uh, I usually charge $85 to you know, take one apart like this, clean it, lubricate it, and then if it needs any parts, parts are you know, whatever the uh, DeWalt price is on that. Just for the ones that don't know Bob, I think last week he, he spent like three hours and fixed the saw over the phone with a, with a lady in Maine. Or yeah, there was, there was a lady in Maine and then uh, over, the, over the past two weeks there's been a gentleman in uh, just outside of Ithaca, New York that I talked to him through uh, repairing his saw. Matter of fact, it, it turned out to be two saws <laughs> by the time we were done. So he was, he was thrilled to death with that. Just over the phone or FaceTime or Skype or anything like that? Uh, most of it over the phone and taking pictures and sending in the pictures. <laughs>